and welcome to the seminar on proteinopathies. The speaker for today are um, Dr. Roland Winter from Dartmouth University, Germany, and Dr. Catherine Royer from RPI in New York. They are collaborators. They've been collaborating and publishing together, a lot of publications coming out nicely. And they had together pioneered the effects of pressure to obtain unique information about the microscopic properties of molecular systems, various systems, including chemical materials and proteins and quadruplex and so on and so forth. So we are going to learn a lot about uh, this topic today uh, from these pioneers. It's my pleasure today to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Roland Winter. Um, Roland studied chemistry at the Technical University of Karlsruhe, um, where he received his diploma thesis. He did his postdoctoral work um, on liquid metals in Professor Hensel's lab at the Philips uh, University of Marburg. He then sp uh, spent a year at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, as a visiting scientist in Professor Jiri Jonas' lab, uh, where he began to work on biomolecular systems. He went back to Germany after habilitation in physical chemistry at the University of Marburg. Uh, he became um, uh, the chair of physical chemistry at Dartmouth University, where he, is, he has been um, a professor there. His main research interests include the study of structure, salvation, dynamics, and function of biomolecular systems, with a particular focus on biomembranes. A special focus of his research is also devoted to pressure effects on uh, biomolecular systems and including biophysical aspects. In addition to the high quality research contributions, Dr. Winters has served in various roles. Uh, he was the head of the Association of German uh, Chemistry Professors, and he was also the editor in chief of Bio Biochemistry, Biophysical Chemistry Journal. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Roland Winter uh, to present his talk. Dr. Winter, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rams, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. And it's a great pleasure to participate in your very nice um, um, series of seminars. And um, so I will share my screen and uh, hope you can see that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will uh, start off uh, with an uh, introduction a bit into uh, high pressure biophysics, so, so some general introduction, then I will talk a bit about the phase diagrams of proteins and liquid liquid phase separation and disentangling polymerization and aggregation pathways by pressure access experiments. Also mention the confinement co-solvents effect and then a, a bit on uh, amyloidogenic peptide DNA interactions also under pressure and uh, finish off uh, maybe with some uh, examples for uh, amyloid fibril enzymes and uh, also under, under pressure, and then uh, finish off with some conclusions. So uh, this work uh, has been carried out by quite a number of uh, my students, and I have also um, enjoyed collaboration with a number of people. And here in particular, I want, of course, uh, to mention Katie Royer and, uh, and uh, Jason Silva for, for this talk. Okay, so normally in, in biochemistry or in biophysical chemistry, we are used to carry out experiments under dilute uh, buffer conditions at one bar and typically 25 or 37 degrees centigrade. But, but you know that in principle, we have to look into the interior of a cell where we have uh, facing uh, crowding effects. And there are a lot of uh, co-solvents which have to be taken into account but on Earth, we also encounter extreme conditions like uh, low temperature, high temperature, and of course, also high pressure conditions. For example, organisms have to thrive even at uh, 1000 bar in, 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 in the deep ocean. Right? So we have uh, to take care of high pressure effects too. So this is for the biological relevance. And uh, of course, there is also a biophysical aspect or biophysics aspect to uh, using the pressure variable. And uh, so why? As you probably know, pressure is an important uh, variable to study pure volume effects. So you can determine the reaction volume, you can determine the activation volume, which provides you with additional information. Then you can tune intermolecular forces. Yeah. 
you can change the viscosity, the electric permittivity and other properties of the solvent in a continuous way. Using pressure jump relaxation techniques, you can study the kinetics of structural and phase transitions. In principle, pressure is a very mild perturbating agent. Yeah, quite different when you increase the temperature or add, uh, for example, urea to, to unfold proteins. And very important, high hydrostatic pressure may increase the occupancy of so far undetected uh, excited states. Here I show you the folding funnel of a protein. And as you know, in the native state, yeah, so we still encounter a number of con conformational substates. Yeah? And by pressure, you can populate particular conformational substates, which have a smaller partial molar volume, yeah, and, 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 and then study this uh, low-lying excited states, yeah, which could can be conformational, functional substates. They could be folding or aggregation intermediates. And of course, then, the, as I mentioned already, there is a biological relevance of high pressure studies, so probably had an impact on the evolution of life. So prob life probably started in, 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 in the deep sea, where organisms are still uh, living. Yeah, sometimes they look a bit strange, as you can see here. So the maximum pressures these uh, organisms have to encounter, like this one here, for example, is about 1,100 bar. Yeah, so on average, we have 500 bar. So the question is then, uh, obviously, life at these extremes uh, exists, but it's hardly explored. Yeah, And so the question is, how do organisms adapt to these extreme conditions? And for us, it's of particular interest, what does pressure do to biomolecular systems? Or also, what are the physical limits of life? And of course, there might be then also applications yeah, deriving from these pressure dependent studies in chemical biology and uh, biotechnology. Yeah, for example, known for a long time, high pressure food processing, in particular in, in Japan. Yeah, you can buy high pressure uh, processed uh, food in particular areas of, of the food stores. And then high pressure can be used to extract bioactives yeah, from fruit. It can, help separate protein complexes, yeah, for example, yeah, destroy amyloid, yeah, or refold proteins from inclusion bodies. I will talk a bit how pressure enzymology, yeah, so how uh, high pressure can help uh, foster enzymatic reactions. And there might be also biomedical applications, yeah, from Chiri Jonas, explored a long time already use of pressure uh, to generate uh, viral vaccines, yeah, which still retain some kind of immunogenicity. And there might be, and, and, and uh, there are also uh, pharmaceutical products uh, um, uh, produced uh, under high pressure conditions, for example, new polymorphs of tablets and so on. Okay, so let's start. What, what happens under pressure? So we will essentially talk about proteins, in particular Kathy, but I thought at the very beginning I'd talk uh, just very briefly about pressure effects, starting maybe on other biomolecules like membranes. Here I show you a high pressure study of giant unilaminar vesicles. And what you have seen, so we started off in a fluid-like state and some, at some particular pressure, then you see these dark areas coming up. Here we generate liquid ordered domains. Yeah? And if we would increase the pressure even up to top one, 2000 bars, then we would end up in a fully uh, um, gel-like ordered uh, membrane state, which uh, is then, of course, not biologically relevant. And uh, as a simple example, I show you here the temperature pressure phase diagram of one component system. You probably remember the DPPC, lipid bilayers, yeah, which have two saturated 216 change, having the transition from the gel state to the fluid-like state at about 51 degrees centigrade. Yeah, and when you change the chain lengths and the head group, so, so yeah, you, you end up with different uh, uh, transition temperatures from the gel to the fluid-like state. So what we observe, yeah, with increasing pressure, the chain melting transition, yeah, uh, increases. Yeah, so of course pressure stabilizes the ordered uh, gel state. Yeah, because it has a smaller partial molar volume. And now imagine the deep sea organisms, yeah, they have to live at temperatures something like three, four degrees centigrade up to pressures of one kilobar. And to be able, right, to still uh, work in the fluid-like membrane state, yeah, so they have to 
uh, have such kind of uh, lipids incorporated in their membranes, the cis unsaturated one, like the oil, the oleophosphatidylcholine or ethanolamine. Yeah, and in fact, it has been observed already a long time ago, right? So deep sea organisms have a higher concentration of cis unsaturated lipids. And, um, and of course, there are other adaptation mechanisms uh, for membranes and uh, like the contents of, of sterols and, and, and things like that. So now let's, so membranes are, are really uh, very pressure sensitive. This is not the case for B uh, DNA. Here I show you the pressure temperature phase diagram of uh, B DNA uh, and, uh, by Chalikian et al. And you see here at ambient temperatures when we increase the pressure. So essentially nothing happens, right? So the double stranded uh, B DNA is really stable. And, uh, but in recent years, it has been found that there is uh, rather pronounced pressure sensitive for smaller DNA structures. Yeah, the RNA DNA hairpins, quadruplexes, and eye motifs. And uh, we have been looking into that uh, using single molecule high pressure FRET studies. Yeah, so we used a high pressure cell, which is actually a square shaped quartz capillary, which can withstand uh, pressure up to two kilobar. And you can do single molecule studies. Yes, so you have two FRET labels, right? And, and you remember probably that the fresh efficiency uh, goes to the power of the distance to the minus six. So this allows you to explore the conformational substrates and dynamics by our measurements of the fluorescence distances by recording the FRET efficiency. You can also do high pressure NMR. This is uh, on such kind of systems. Uh, this is, has been done in Katie Royer's lab. And uh, I, I might mention that a bit later. So we looked into the pressure stability of the telomeric quadruplexes and eye motifs, and uh, also uh, looking into co-solvent effects, right? And, 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 and so these quad uh, G quadruplexes, as visualized here, they are formed by guanine-rich uh, nucleate acid sequences and these eye motifs by cytosine-rich sequences. So they are found here in the telomeric region of chromosomes are involved in the regulation of gene expression. And I just show you one example here because we wanted to concentrate more on proteins. So the effect of high pressure on the interaction between monomeric alpha synuclein and the eye motive structure, uh, human telomeric one. Here I show you now the FRET efficiency at ambient pressure and here as a function of pressure. Yeah, so the FRET efficiency of about 0.6 corresponds to a partially folded eye motive structure, yeah, which uh, prevails at the pH 7.5. So it's partially folded. It's only perfectly folded at lower pH. And you see here, so, so it's, it, it's really pressure stable, telling us, yeah, so this uh, structure is devoid of packing defects. Otherwise, it would be easily unfold like many DNA hairpins do. And here you see the effect of an when we add the intrinsically disordered protein alpha synuclein. Here you see a peak yeah, of, of FRET efficiency close to one, which corresponds to this perfectly folded structure. Yeah, so interestingly, so yeah, the monomeric alpha synuclein induces folding of the eye motif. And what about the effect of pressure? You see, essentially nothing happens. So obviously, also the alpha synuclein. The eye motif complex is densely packed. It's essentially stabilized by hydrogen bonds, right? Because they are fostered under high pressure. So this is the situation with the monomeric alpha synuclein. Now, when, when you add alpha synuclein oligomers, yeah, uh, then you see the following. Here again is the, the pure eye motif pressure dependence essentially not happening. When we add oligomeric uh, alpha synuclein also binds yeah, to the eye motif, to the DNA. Right? So uh, population increases up to about 50% folded state. And now you see in the pressure dependence that this folded conformation, yeah, as shown here, yeah, is reversed right, to the partially folded one. Right? So what happens here? Um, so first we have seen alpha synuclein oligomers induce the folding, but then pressure dissociate alpha synuclein aggregates. And you can determine the volume of unfolding. It's about minus 50 milliliters per mole. Yeah, and you uh, create monomeric protein. And that's the reason that this FRET efficiency peak is disappearing. 
So what is the reason? Yes, we have under pressure loosening of intermolecular packing, rupture of intermolecular salt bridges, and, and probably also uh, uh, pressure helps to, uh, um, to, un, uh, to uh, dissociate the protein via the pressure effect on the hydrophobic interaction. And which I is not showing here. I mean, if you add, for example, uh, um, compatible osmolites right, like trimethylamine uh, enoxide or, or crowding agents, then this uh, uh, pressure effect is, is prohibited. Yeah, so altogether, alpha synuclein and, and other intrinsically disordered proteins, right? So they affect single non canonical DNA structures in a sequence specific way. Yeah, we have seen folding of I motifs. And uh, the same holds true for DNA hairpins. The opposite is, 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 is happening with quadruplexes, right? This has been shown by high pressure NMR from Kathy Royer's lab as well. Very under pressure, you see a transition from an anti parallel to a parallel G quadruplex conformation. And if the pressure is even higher, the quadruplexes unfold, right? And of course, this uh, will have severe consequences for expression profiles and disease modif mod modifying genes. Now let's uh, uh, switch to, to, to protein. And this is, uh, as you probably know, the four folding funnel. Yeah, and uh, the partial molar volume goes in this direction. So the native state has a larger partial molar volume yeah, due to a large number of, of voids. And uh, so pressure leads to unfolding of proteins. You typically need uh, two to five, eight, nine kilobars to do that. And, uh, but you can populate at medium pressures also low-lying excited states, right? So they are accessible too. And you can also tune conformational interconversion. You can modulate enzymatic reaction signaling processes and so on uh, in the intermediate uh, pressure range. Yeah, and, and, and this uh, has uh, staphylococcus, is all that started essentially the, the collaboration with Casey with, with that molecule. We did a lot of SACS, FDR, fluorescence measurements. And here you see the stability diagram of the staphylococcal nuclease. And uh, this is elliptic like, which showing you that you can unfold the protein by heat in the cold. It's called cold denaturation, very well known phenomenon, but also under pressure, right? So what is the reason? As I mentioned already, I mean, when you unfold the protein, you have and, and you have void volume, and uh, so this is probably the major contribution. When you unfold the protein, the void volume is filled with water, and so this leads to a drastic reduction in 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 a partial molar volume. But there are other contributions too. For example, if salt bridges are exposed, then you have electrostriction. Uh, water is rather strongly bound uh, around the anions and cations, leading to a volume decrease as well. Right? And uh, what about the grounding effect? And here I show you again the PT stability diagram of this protein. And when you, for example, put this protein in a macromolecular grounding agent like FICOL, or something like that, dextran, then you see that the stability diagram changes. Yeah, so it leads to an increase of the temperature stability and drastically an increase in the, in the uh, pressure stability of the protein, which as you can imagine is essentially due to the large excluded volume effect, yeah, which stabilizes compact structures. So also in the native structure of the protein. Now let's go to the pressure effects on polymerization and depolymerization reactions. And we looked into the effects on actin and tubulin. And because actually these filaments have been shown a long time already uh, ago to be among the most pressure sensitive assemblies in, in vivo. Yeah, a few hundred bars is sufficient to, to affect the polymerization reaction of actin and tubulin. And we looked into the effect of pressure on the nucleation rate and the elongation rate uh, of uh, actin and tubulin. And I show you here just the example of the actin. Here first, the pressure temperature stability diagram here of the monomeric uh, unit, the G actin, here of the bundles and here of the F actin, yeah, so the filamentous actin as depicted here. So obviously this monomeric unit, right, 
is, is uh, has rather limit, limited pressure stability and is responsible for the high pressure sensitivity of actin filaments in, in the kilobar range. Yeah. And here I show you uh, uh, some TEM images, what is going to happen here in case of the filamentous uh, um, actin. So we start off here at one bar at 25 degrees centigrade and increase the pressure. Yeah, so at ambient conditions, we have these long helical filaments and you can even see helical grooves. We increase the pressure. Yeah, we still see filaments, increase the pressure further. And then you see a short fibrils coming up and then above the transition line, essentially monomeric uh, protein is seen here only at high pressure conditions. Yeah. And then we looked also into the kinetics of formation of, of filamentous actin and the pressure effect here. And this is shown here as a function of time. So this is some fluorescence experiment here. So the pyrene intensity is proportional to formation of filamentous actin. And here you see <clears throat> some um, um, elongation curve here and the effect of pressure from one to two kilobars, and you see high pressure drastically retards actin polymerization reaction. And you can model this reaction, and, and what you learn is that the nucleation rate decreases by two orders of magnitude. And this is due to a la rather large activation volume, which of course is positive. Yeah, so telling us that the uh, polymerization reaction is drastically retarded. And here, just the effect of a compatible osmolites, again, the TMAO or crowding agent would do a similar job, right? So uh, the presence of, of such kind of compatible osmolites, the suppression of the nucleation rate by pressure is partially compensated. Again, this is due uh, to the excluded volume effect imposed here by crowders or, or, or all these molecular ch chaperones. So what we have seen here that compatible os Overlights co-solvents are able to markedly influence temperature and pressure uh, dependent cellular processes, folding reactions, association reactions. Now let's switch to higher concentrations. Here I show you now the temperature lysozyme concentration phase diagram. Yeah, so we looked in also in, in recent years into the effect of pressure on highly concentrated protein solutions, which show also liquid-liquid phase separation typically at low temperatures, as you have see, as you see here for the lysozyme below 10 degrees centigrade, yeah, where we have coexistence of a dilute uh, lysozyme phase uh, together with uh, trip, uh, lysozyme droplets of high concentration. So why should that be of interest? Of course, that's of course of interest for purification and crystallization studies for learning about aggregation phenomena, cataract fibrillation, but also for protein drug formulation where you need high concentration. And of course, for, for also for understanding intracellular routing effects. So we looked into several systems and looked now into the effect of co-solutes and, and, and pressure. And, and of course, as, as you know, I mean, this liquid-liquid phase separation yeah, uh, is a big issue now in, also in cell biology. Yeah, it has been found in RNA protein systems uh, which form this membrane less condensate, so they appear to be a ubiquitous mechanism for intracellular organization. They are found in the nucleus, for example, the nuclei, but also in, in the cytosol in form of stress uh, granules. And most important for, for, for here, such condensates can also lead to pathological disorders. Yeah, for example, cataract or solid assemblies in fibrous deposit of neurogenerative diseases, and you had to talk in this seminar series about that uh, already. Just one example here, the, the crystallines. Yeah, so the crystallines, as you probably remember, they constitute the major proteins of our islands. And uh, so they exist actually in a fluid-like state, but they are very densely packed, yeah? Packing fraction 50 to 60%. And any inhomogeneity of this densely packed uh, protein mixture, for example, by liquid-liquid phase separation, crystallization, yeah, or fibrillation causes opacity and, and uh, of, of the lens leading to cataract. 
And interestingly, these crystallines here, for example, gamma crystalline, they show liquid liquid phase separation with an upper critical point here in the temperature concentration phase diagram. Yeah, and, and, and mutation shift this upper critical uh, solution temperature uh, significantly. Yeah, and we looked into the effect of, of pressure on such kind of uh, LLPS system. And this is shown here. These are now high pressure microscopy studies. You see these uh, micrometer large droplets at ambient pressure here at uh, four degrees centigrade. And you see with increasing pressure, these droplets more or less disappear and uh, above three, four hundred, you hardly see anything. And here in, in this movie, you will see when we decrease the pressure, so go in the reverse direction, that it, this process is fully reversible. Right. So obviously, this liquid liquid phase separation is strongly affected high pressure, right? And uh, so this LLPS phenomena, these biomolecular protein condensates, actually seem to be among the most pressure sensitive processes encountered in biomolecular systems, maybe next to the membrane systems. And of course, you can detect this easily by uh, turbidity experiments. Yeah, so you measure absorption as a function of temperature. And for that uh, protein, yeah, you see at about four degrees centigrade, yeah, you reach the upper critical point, yeah, and then, then you enter the one phase region. And you can do corresponding pressure dependent measurements yeah, to determine the phase diagram. And also interestingly here, when you add uh, uh, compatible osmolites that, that, like the TMO, you increase yeah, the upper critical solution temperature drastically and also the upper critical uh, pressure. So you increase um, the stability yeah, of the two-phase system by adding compatible osmolites like glycerol, TMO, and, and so on. Yeah, so obviously co-solvents such as TMO are able to rescue the stability of condensed protein phases, even at high pressures. And uh, the same holds true if you add FICO. Yes, so here you see turbidity measurements as a function of temperature. And you see that the cloud temperature increases drastically upon addition of this crowding agent FICO. Yeah. So as I said, inert macromolecular crowding agents are able to drastically increase the temperature and pressure stability of, of, of protein droplet phases, yeah, which might be quite important. Uh, for organisms uh, living in the deep sea. And so what is the mechanism about uh, uh, for that? And uh, so at ambient conditions in these really very densely packed uh, uh, protein droplets, we in fact have also imperfect packing here, right? Yeah, due to transient contacts, yeah, we have some uh, packing defects, void volume, and then of course, increasing pressure. These are filled by water. Yeah, and that's the reason that they are stabilized under pressure. And TMAO, as mentioned before, has this uh, uh, opposing effect due to the excluded volume effect. Yeah, TMAO has, right, it, it really supports uh, structures of, of, of higher compactness, so it stabilizes the folded state. Now, uh, a few words about the effect of pressure on amyloid formation. So we looked a long time ago already into insulin, IPP, and alpha-synuclein, prion protein has been studied essentially in the, uh, uh, in the Chilson lab in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, so what is the effect of pressure? As you know, the fibrillation reaction yeah, starts essentially with formation of, of oligomers, yeah, which then line up and you form these fibrils. And here I show you for the insulin case, some THD fluorescence data as a function of time. And for this particular case, you see the increase of THD fluorescence or light scattering or sucks intensity at about eight hours. Yeah, so obviously here we have the elongation reaction and then fibrils are formed and they have this kind of structure here. Now, when we apply pressure, you see, see essentially that, that doesn't seem to, to happen a lot only if you expand that scale. So fibrils are still forming, but aggregation is strongly suppressed, retarded, yeah? Because there must be then a volume change, which is largely positive. But what is also interesting, that in the pressure uh, fibrillar state, which you can finally look at in, in, using AFM, for example, here, 
you see that you have an enhancement of band ring like supramolecular folds. So obviously what we observe here, the ability of high pressure to evoke particular amyloidogenic pathways. Yeah, and this one with a smaller spatial molar volume. So this tells us that we obviously have here an inhomogeneous void distribution in, in these fibrillar structures. And so these pressure dependent studies may also help uh, learn about the polymorphism of fib fibrillar states. And of course, this uh, is different for mature fibrils or the oligomers. Here again, I show you the insulin data, THT data uh, after a, a pressure application of one kilobar. So in the, the mature state is rather uh, pressure stable, but not so the oligomers. Yeah, you see the effect of pressure. Yeah, so THT for us is drastically decreases. Yeah, because the olig olig oligomers dissociate. Yeah, so this has been observed for, for most systems, a major pressure sensitivity only at the early stages of the aggregation fibrillation process. Yeah, essentially, uh, oligomers are, are rather prone to dissociate. Yeah, so loose aggregate structures like amorphous aggregates and, and these oligomers and droplets, like also in LAPS systems, so they can be redissolved or refolded uh, under high pressure. By the way, also proteins can be refolded uh, from in inclusion bodies. Yeah. Whereas mature uh, fibrils like the uh, insulin fibrils yeah, do, do not dissociate much. Yeah. May maybe partially dissociate of laterally assembly fibrils only. Yeah, and, and this has been further explored in a high pressure NMR study uh, by Chairs and Silva. Who, who looked by NMR also into the dissociation of alpha synuclein fibrils, so they are rather pressure sensitive too. First, uh, forming a population of monomers after application of one kilobar, but also prefibrillar structures, which finally dissociate to the monomeric state uh, above two kilobars. Yeah, and from this data, one can conclude how the internal structure looks like. So it contains cavities and salt bridge in a hydrophobic core, which are rather pressure sensitive. And that's essentially the reason for the pressure induced uh, dissociation of the alpha synuclein fibrils. Yeah? So obvious uh, and, and quite interesting variants of alpha synuclein have different uh, pressure stabilities, oh, probably then, of course, owing due to different packing properties and core structures. So uh, obviously high pressure studies and amyloid helps characterize the different polymorphic structures and helps uncover intermediate oligomeric and potentially also toxic uh, uh, assemblies. And um, there's also some application, yeah, by a combined treatment of high pressure and temperature, for example, infectious prion uh, um, um, fibrils can, can be destroyed. Finally, at the end, I will talk a bit uh, very briefly about the uh, effect of pressure on enzyme reactions. So if you remember here in the pressure temperature plane where we have this uh, uh, elliptic like uh, uh, area where the protein can be in a native state, an increase of temperature and an increase of pressure can lead to thermal stabilization. Yeah, of the protein. So this might help, for example, in enzyme reactions, which then can be carried out at uh, higher temperatures. And there is a pressure induced activation of the reaction. Yeah? When you have a negative activation volume, meaning yeah, that the transition state has a smaller partial molar volume that the partial molar volumes of enzyme and substrate or the enzyme substrate complex, yeah, then the reaction can be accelerated, yeah, because the K cut value, yeah, depends exponentially on the activation volume. Yeah, if, for example, uh, you have an activation volume of minus 20 milliliters per mole, which is not a lot, yeah, it's essentially just one mole of uh, just one uh, water molecule, and apply 10 kilobars, then you can accelerate the reaction by a factor of 50. And um, here, I just show you an example, the effect of pressure on a, high, a hydrolysis reaction here of a finger enzyme. Here, you, you just see here the hydrolysis reaction of this uh, nitrophenyl acetate, and this uh, is recorded by 
uh, spectroscopy in a high pressure stop flow arrangement. And what you see here that the catalytic efficiency and the K-cat value also increased by about a factor of five, yeah, up to a uh, pressure of uh, two kilobars. Meaning that obviously the activation volume is negative. It can be determined. It's a minus 18 milliliters per mole. And this is actually consistent here with the QMMM uh, calculation result, yeah, showing that it probably has some kind of carbonic anhydrase uh, um, in the uh, activated state, meaning it has a rather compact pentacoordinated transition state. And that's probably the reason that we have this negative activation volume. And uh, you probably uh, know this uh, paper from the RE group. Yeah, I mean, also amyloid structures, they can provide a framework to support catalytic activity. They might have also served as primitive enzymes. And we looked into one of these systems, the zinc binding amyloidogenic peptides, yeah, which form already with uh, heptapeptide uh, sequences. And we looked also into a simple uh, uh, hydrolysis reaction here. Of, of, of this system. And what you see here is the initial velocity as a function of substrate concentration. Yeah, so the Michaelis Menten plot. And here the catalytic efficiency as a function of pressure. And what you see here that also in this case, you see a drastic acceleration of, of, of the reaction and of the catalytic efficiency also here about a factor of five or so. Yeah, so in principle, pressure can drastically enhance the reaction velocity and enzymatic efficiency also of uh, fibrillar enzymes. Uh, again, because yeah, they have a, a smaller uh, volume in the activated state compared to the enzyme substrate complex, which can actually be visualized here in this volume profile of the enzymatic reaction. Here we have the partial molar volume of enzyme plus substrate here of the enzyme substrate complex and here of the transition state, right? Uh, of the enzyme substrate complex, yeah, which has the smallest uh, partial molar volume of minus 14 uh, milliliters per mole. Right? All right, so I think my time is up and I want to summarize uh, what we have seen here. So what I hoped I could show you that uh, high pressure acts on the structure and dynamics of biomolecular system through changes in volume. And those are largely due to changes in packing efficiency and hydration. The balance between hydrogen bonding, electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions can be tuned by pressure. Yeah, for example, pressure fosters hydrogen bonding yeah, and it loses uh, electrostatic interactions, for example, of salt bridges in, in protein and, uh, and also hydrophobic interactions. Pressure changes the folding landscape of protein. Yeah? And uh, so pressure can occupy so far undetected high energy conformation of substrate. It retards aggregation, polymerization, and fibrillation reactions and affects uh, liquid liquid phase separation. And what I could partially show you only that different routes of aggregation may be chosen under different temperature pressure and solvation and confinement conditions, leading to multiple amyloid structures or different strains, showing the structural polymorphism of such kind of systems. Then we have seen that crowders and co-solutes mimicking intracellular conditions are able to modify temperature and pressure effects and biomolecular stability dynamics, interactions, and reactions. And uh, there might be also applications here. Yeah, I, I quickly mentioned that upon passing of pressure effects on available bio, uh, or, or on valuable biotechnological te uh, tools. And uh, baroenzymology, I mentioned, and uh, reversal of protein aggregation, refolding of protein from inclusion bodies, and so on. So with this, I'd like to to, to end here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Roland. This was a lovely talk. Great topics. Um, let's give 30 seconds to a minute to people to post questions in the Q&A box. I have a question meanwhile. Um, great topics. We covered a lot of topics in, in pioneering this area very much. Um, can the disordered monomer, monomers of amyloid proteins, can you use high pressure to force them to aggregate to form fibers without forming any oligomers and intermediates? Did you ever 
Um, so when you start from, from, let's say, from intrinsically disordered proteins like like alpha synuclein, so they will not form oligomers okay. and they will not fibrilize. Yeah, because the initial reaction, yeah, which, which is uh, um, the nucleation, yeah, is not densely packed. It has always a lot of white volume, and and that's the reason that they really don't form. And the effect of um, pressure on largely intrinsically disordered proteins is of course very small, right? I think it has been uh, done in, uh, uh, it was postdoc in, in, in your lab, but what is his name? And um, I forgot. And so the effect uh, on intrinsically disordered protein is very small, yeah? So for example, in alpha synuclein, you populate a, a bit more of these P2 uh, structures and lose a bit of transient alpha helical structures. So this kind of stuff, yeah, but no aggregation is seen. What about the heteromolecular systems? Have you tried, um, for example, cross seeding or any hetero protein protein um, systems that you're able to look at under high pressure? Yeah, this this is what we haven't done so far. Yeah, so so you mean co-aggregation, for example, yeah. a beta IPP or something like that, right? You, which yeah. affect each other, as we know. Mm -hmm. And a long time ago, uh, I think when we attended some other conference many years ago, we looked into the their effect on, on the interaction with membranes, right? So this has been largely studied, but not the effect of pressure. And um, this might be quite interesting, yeah, because their propensity to, yep. to, to form fibrils or even oligomers or some other structures might, uh, might, might change. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Participants, please post your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will take uh, direct questions at the end of both the presentations. So for now, post your questions in the Q&A box. I have another question. Um, did you ever try the toxicity of these fibers, uh, uh, different kind of polymorphic fibers formed under high pressure for amyloid proteins? No, toxic no. Or not toxic? Uh, yeah, that, that's obviously an obvious thing to do. And uh, we, 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 we never did, uh, Ramos. We never did. Uh, okay. because it, a... Go ahead. Sorry. It's very difficult to, to, to separate the different structures, right, we, which we should generate. So that's the reason that we never did that. There is a question in Q&A box. You can also open and check. I will read it for you. This is from Luigi Vitaliano of Vitagliano. Uh, interesting talk. Um, have you measured the effect of pressure on hydrogels formed by amyloid-like self-assembling peptides or proteins? No, we haven't looked at, at hydrogels uh, so far. I mean, I have shown you examples, and I, I mentioned the high pressure sensitivity of, of, of this protein droplets, but not all protein droplets and also not all hydrogels are pressure sensitive. For example, those of intrinsically disordered proteins, right? So they are uh, not really pressure sensitive, only when uh, folded structures are involved, which can create a lot of void volume. So I would guess that the effect of pressure on hydrogels is, is rather weak. It's another question from Ehud Gazit. Uh, very nice work. What is known on the pressure phase diagram of amino acids uh, and other metabolites? Uh, you mean of uh, amino acids, just pure amino acids? Yeah, and, like and other metabolites. Yeah. And well, um, there is essentially no pressure sensitivity of that, right? Because the the, the effect of pressure is, is is large essentially only if you have uh, structures with uh, some kind of voids, right? And so the monomeric states are typically fully hydrated, and the effect of pressure is is rather weak, and and it will be different from. Uh, for, for systems where you have electrostatic interactions, yeah? So monomer association, yeah? So association, for example, of amino acids, uh, which actually uh, you are looking at, uh, I, I remember some of your work, and there, there might be then uh, a pressure effect because when you lose um, or can dissociate salt bridges under pressure, yeah? then this might be connected with a decrease of volume due to the electrostriction effect. But the monomeric, the, the monomers are, are, are typically uh, pressure stable, all of them. 
Yeah, I think that's what you meant. Uh, you followed up the comment. This is Woody. I meant the crystal packing for metabolites and amino acids. That's what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the crystal packing um, of amino acids. Or metabolites. Or, or metabolites, yeah. So this actually has not been studied really. I think essentially only uh, the effect of pressure on protein crystals, something like that. Yeah? And, um, and the forces in, in crystals are very different. So the unfolding pressures are also very different from uh, for proteins in crystals compared to, uh, to, to, to the bulk uh, li liquid state. So I, I would assume if you have still a lot of, of, of solvent liquor in your crystals that the pressure effect will be, will, will be very small. Yeah. But there are actually measurements on, of high pressure on um, crystals of amino acids showing that they uh, did, do not necessarily uh, completely uh, dissociate these crystals, but they uh, they might transform uh, different uh, to different structures, right? So, for example, cubic to hexagonal, this kind of thing. Yeah? So, this has been studied by by, by a Russian group. Uh, where they looked into the effect of pressure on on amino acid uh, crystals. So, they just undergo um, changes of the crystal structure. Yeah. But there is essentially no effect on, 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 on the monomeric conformation. Kathy, would you like to add anything on the PKA dependence? You, you posted a comment. Yeah, I just was going to say the one thing that pressure can do to amino acids in solution is, is modulate the PKA, right? Because uh, due to yeah. electrostriction um, of the of the charges. So, you, you know, you could, you could see that sort of thing and depending on what you're interested in. Okay, Roland, another question from anonymous attendee. What is the relevance of synuclein motive interactions? Yeah, actually, I mean, we have learned that uh, alpha synuclein is also found in the nucleus, right? And uh, it has been shown already by by papers many years ago that it interacts with uh, DNA. And so, yeah, so we uh, we found it interesting to, to, to look into the effect of uh, alpha synuclein also on LLPS systems, right? On, on, on protein RNA droplets. Yeah. And while we are, have been doing that, uh, we looked into the effect of alpha synuclein also into these non canonical structures. There's another question from Binzu. Uh, hypothetically, if you start from oligomers of amyloidogenic proteins, will they more likely to dissociate into monomers or fibrils under high pressure? They will always, uh, oligomers, dissociate into monomers, right? Yeah. 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 All right, so we'll stop with, with this. Uh, we'll, we'll take more questions at the end. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Roland, for the great talk. And we'll move on to the second speaker, uh, Zone. Please take over. Zone, your turn now. Sorry, yeah. I was having trouble getting my video back on. Yeah. So, um, thank you for beautiful talk. And now we're going to move to part two uh, with uh, Catherine Royer. And I am delighted to introduce her. So uh, Catherine uh, received her bachelor's degree in Paris at the University of Pierre and Marie Curie. And she then returned to the United States to do her PhD at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And you're gonna see a pattern here where Catherine moves between countries. So she then returned to Paris to do uh, postdoctoral research. And subsequently, went back to the United States, uh, first at UIUC and then uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where she was both assistant and then associate professor. In 97, she moved back to France where she became director of research and then director of the Center for Structural Biology in Montpellier. And in 2014, she moved back once again to the United States 
and she is currently, and we will see for, for how long, Catherine, you will stay here uh, at Rensselaer uh, RPI, where she is a chaired constellation professor in biocomputation and bioinformatics. So Catherine is a world-renowned expert in uh, biochemistry and biophysics, uh, particularly in the areas of biological fluorescence, protein folding, and biomolecular interactions. And she's known not only for her experimental work, but also for her computational work, in particular the development of analysis software. Her uh, research area is quite broad. It covers many areas of biophysics, but to keep the theme coherent today, we've asked her to talk about her pioneering work in the area of uh, pressure effects on uh, proteins, so or, or biomolecular structures in general. So Catherine, I will turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much, Joan, for that. Uh lovely introduction and, and thank you very much for um, inviting me to, to uh, share our work uh, with, with your group today. Um, interested in, in amyloid, amyloid uh, interactions. Um, today I'm gonna talk about um, sort of what happens before amyloid interactions. And let me just share my screen here and get my PowerPoint going. Um, so, um, we uh, use pressure, um, as Roland has said, um, to uh, map protein conformational landscapes. And so today I'm gonna um, first tell you a little bit about why pressure unfolds proteins. And then we're gonna do a deep dive um, and to the detailed information you get um, with pressure-based mapping of folding landscapes. Um, and we're gonna explore how the ensemble um, uh, of a particular protein uh, is modulated by pressure and sequence. So um, as Roland pointed out, you know, proteins can uh, exist in these excited conformational states that have uh, implications for uh, biological function. Um, they can enhance or, or actually decrease uh, activity. They can um, uh, change post-translational modification uh, probabilities. Um, and uh, as is interesting to you, uh, this group, um, excited states, as Roland says, can um, actually interact with each other uh, and populate conformations that eventually lead to aggregation and perhaps proteinopathies. And so all of this um, sort of activity uh, underscores the importance of uh, being able to do a detailed characterization of excited states. Um, and uh, I hope to show you, uh, after Roland has already actually shown you uh, uh, a great deal, uh, the pressure perturbation is a really useful tool for those kinds of studies. Also, like Roland, I'm really interested in how life can exist uh, in extreme environments, and in particular in the deep biosphere. Um, and this includes, uh, as Roland pointed out, the deep open trenches, the ocean trenches that go down to, you know, a kilobar or so of pressure, uh, and also elsewhere in the deep dark sea, but also in the sediments, the oceanic crust, and there's a lot of, of life in, in the continental crust as well. In fact, more than in the oceans. And it's estimated that more than 80% of the microbial biomass on the planet lives at high pressure. And so because of what Roland just told you of all the havoc that can be wreaked by pressure uh, on, on biomolecules of all sorts, um, you really, it begs the question of, of how, uh, what is the molecular signature of, um, of pressure adaptation? And, and that's a question that, that my group has been more and more interested in uh, going forward. So, um, but today um, uh, we're gonna talk about proteins and uh, protein conformational landscapes. And I just wanna uh, go over again, what Roland said about why pressure does what it does to these molecules. And it's because uh, say for a folding reaction, uh, the unfolded system volume, state system volume has um, a, I lost my, there it is, where'd it go? There it is. Uh, it has a lower volume. Um, and uh, the protein solvent system. And why is that? Um, well, this change in volume between the folded and the unfolded state includes um, it, a change in the solvent excluded void volumes within the folded state that, that Roland alluded to, and also um, a change in uh, solvation where solvent molecules move from the bulk uh, to interact with um, 
the unfolded protein chain. And, and, and so the number of those molecules and also uh, the density differences between the solvent in the bulk and the, and, and the, the solvent interacting uh, with the protein uh, could lead to uh, a volume change. Um, whereas the, the void volumes um, that disappear when the protein unfolds um, depend on uh, the specific packing efficiency of the structure uh, in question and also uh, are non-uniformly distributed uh, around the structure. And that's an important uh, point that we'll get back to. So basically, all the experimental evidence uh, indicates that the magnitude of the volume change of unfolding of a protein is primarily determined by the amount of solvent excluded void volume inside the folded protein that's eliminated upon unfolding. There can be electrostrictive effects also um, if in the interior of the protein, there are ionizable residues that get exposed to solvent, but, but those are, are really probably pretty small effects. The density differences in solvent actually depend on wh what kind of, of um, amino acid residue is being solvated, uh, can be of different signs and are strongly temperature, temperature dependent. And so what that means is that basically all the direct hydration effects are, are minimized um, with respect to um, this loss of solvent excluded void volume uh, when the protein unfolds. And like I said, this volume is non-uniformly distributed in the protein structure. So unlike denaturants, um, who, which interact basically with the entire protein chain, um, irrespective of um, what it looks like, uh, pressure effects depend on specific characteristics of folded states of proteins and not a general property, basically size of unfolded states like denaturants. And so the upshot of this is that you have different local pressure susceptibilities inside protein structures um, kind of overlaid on whatever intrinsic uh, energetic differences there may be local energetic differences. And this can lead to enhanced population of excited states. And if you can populate them, uh, then you can study them. And so that's what we do. And so I'm going to, um, oops, I lost my... Uh, picture here. I'm going to tell you about the, the mapping of a, a protein folding landscape of the PP32 protein, which is a collaboration uh, with the Barrick lab, but also has involved Angel Garcia and, and, um, and Roland Winter, <laughs> uh, most notably. Um, and so um, uh, what we're trying to, to understand is what are the, the um, sequence determinants of protein folding cooperativity using uh, high pressure uh, to study that. And I just want to give a shout out uh, to Josh Wand, who made all this work possible by inventing this most wonderful device, which is a little ceramic high pressure NMR tube that works really well. Uh, it's now sold by uh, a company. Um, and so you too can do high pressure NMR. It's really easy. I even have undergraduates in the lab that do high pressure NMR. And so here finally is the, the picture of the protein that somehow disappeared. Period. Um, and the reason we chose this protein with Doug was because it's a repeat protein, a leucine rich repeat protein. It has a big hole in the middle, so I always like that because uh, it's, it's pressure sensitive because of that. Um, and to study cooperativity and the sequence determinants of cooperativity, uh, it's really handy to have a repeat protein that doesn't have any long uh, distance, sequence wise, long distance um, contacts in the protein. Uh, so there are only contacts between adjacent domains. There are no long range contacts in, in such proteins. And so uh, de deciphering the ins and outs of the cooperativity of folding these things is a lot easier than with a globular protein. So that's what we did. Um, this is work by Martin Fossa. Um, and um, so we take an HSQC spectrum, a beautiful folded protein, um, assigned all the peaks and everything. Um, and as you can see, we had to add some urea here. We'll come back to that because the protein is pretty stable. So we had to tune it into the pressure range. Um, this is 2.5 kilo kilobar um, for this particular tube. Now they sell them for, at three kilobar. Josh is working on higher pressure ones. Um, but anyway, to get it into the 2.5 kilobar pressure range, we added a little urea here. And you can see that the uh, NMR spectrum, the 2D uh, uh, proton nitrogen HSQC uh, goes from a nice folded protein to a, an unfolded protein, apparently. Um, and you can see we've, I've just mapped three residues here um, at the end terminus in the middle and the C terminus of the protein. And you can see that even though, and I wanna stress this, 
The loss of each of these peaks is a, is a two-state transition, and we fit it to such uh, because the protein, that peak either is in um, a folded state environment or it's not. It's binary. Uh, so it's a two-state transition locally. But globally, you can tell, since they don't overlay um, in the pressure profile, uh, that the protein is uh, strongly deviation, deviating from uh, two-state unfolding uh, under pressure. So, um, so that's all well and good, um, but we wanted to uh, visualize um, this structural complexity somehow. Um, and this is an idea that was uh, first uh, proposed to me by uh, Julian Roche, who was my graduate student back in France at the time. He's now a professor at Iowa State and doing quite well. Um, but his idea was to create uh, experimental fractional contact maps and histograms uh, using the HSQC peak intensities. And so what we say is that the probability at any given pressure and temperature of a contact being formed between two residues I and J, con a native contact in, in the structure, is the geometric mean of the fractional intensities of the amide resonances of the two residues involved in that contact. Okay, and so we can calculate that uh, at any pressure in, in our pressure profile, and we can do that profile at any temperature. And so uh, here, for example, at 500 bar and 303 degrees Kelvin uh, is the, in gray, the folded state uh, contact map uh, for PP32. And you can see it here. Um, and then um, below it, at are the fractional contacts that we calculate from the NMR spectrum at 500 bar and 303 Kelvin. And what you can see is that in the C-terminal part of the protein, uh, it's pretty folded under these conditions. The fractional contacts are very high, but as you go toward from the C toward the N-terminus, you can see that this little protein is unfolding like a little accordion uh, coming apart. And you can see this also, we calculate these fractional contact histograms and color them according to uh, the the repeat color code that we use. And so yellow is the end terminus and uh, aqua is the C terminal capping motif here. And you can see the protein starts falling apart from the end tor terminus toward the C terminus. Um, and, um, and then I wanted, we wanted to take it uh, even a step farther and uh, try and get some structures and energies uh, uh, out of this. Um, and so what we do is we use these fractional contacts um, to uh, constrain coarse, coarse grain molecular dynamics simulations. And so what we do is we, we create a hundred contact lists. Instead of in normal structure-based calculations, you, you have your contact list and, and you give it uh, <laughs> and at a particular temperature and the protein either stays folded or it unfolds depending on, um, on, uh, on your contact lists and, and, and the... Uh, um, and the structure and energetics of the protein, of course. Um, but what we do is we make 100 lists, and in those lists, a fractional contact is present across the st uh, statistically across the 100 lists at its fractional contact uh, determined by the NMR. So, for example, if residues I and J have a, a probability of 70% contact under some pressure conditions, then 70 of our 100 lists will have that contact randomly, and 30 will not. Right, and so then we run 100 parallel simulations. Um, and, um, and we get a gazillion confirmations. And here you have the RMSD versus Q plot. And you can see that under these conditions, now we're at 900 bar. Uh, we have quite a bit of unfolded state here. Uh, we have the folded state over here. And then we have a whole bunch of intermediate states uh, between the two. Um, and from the populations of those states, we can uh, calculate a pseudo free energy uh, profile for those pressure and temperature conditions. Um, and um, using cluster analysis, we can also uh, go look at any position of, uh, at any Q value uh, and see what the structure uh, generally looks like. And so you can see here at the barrier to folding, uh, we just have uh, the C terminus, which is starting to come together. Um, then as we go across this kind of broad barrier, it starts to, to um, aggregate more and more into a more folded-like structure. Here in this D intermediate, we've got 
you know, about half the protein folded and, and, the, and the end terminal half unfolded. And so you, you can get uh, a lot of very um, detailed information about um, the protein structure. And what we found is that um, PP32 exhibits this uh, stability gradient from the end to the C terminus of, of the protein. And we're interested in understanding if the sequence changes, how does that alter the ensemble? Um, and so um, what I told you is we're gonna do a deep dive into this protein because we're really interested in understanding how, how very you know, single amino acid mutations can modify, uh, generally speaking, uh, protein conformational landscapes. And that, that could be important, for example, in um, amyloid formation uh, with, you know, familial mutations or even somatic mutations uh, of sequences that eventually lead to uh, aggregation and disease. Um, as we know, life hangs on just a couple of kilocals or, or not much more than that. And so, you know, um, it's important that uh, we go in and look at these, these detailed um, uh, energetic relationships between the sequence uh, and the ensemble. So, uh, we, we were first not too, too uh, subtle. Uh, Tui Dao in Doug's lab had, had prepared, she was interested in the role of the capping motifs and the stability of the protein. And so she chopped off the N-terminal cap. You can't chop off the C-terminal cap because that's the first part of the protein to fold, but she, so it doesn't fold if you chop off the C-terminus, but, um, but she did mutate um, uh, two residues that interact in this uh, C-terminal C uh, capping motif. Actually, the blue is the capping motif and, and this is the last last, um, the helix in the last um, repeat, uh, repeat five of the protein. So she made mutations here to destabilize that. Um, and what you can see is that if you mutate the C-terminal cap, then uh, destabilize it, you get unfolding profiles under pressure that are much more cooperative than the, the wild type protein. But if you take off the end cap, you get total chaos uh, occurring here. Uh, in fact, you know, you get really sharp uh, histograms for the C-terminal cap and even, and that look just like the urea unfolding, which is usually much more cooperative than pressure, uh, but these are the same. But the end cap here, uh, these are two different pressures. You can see that <laughs> at 850 bar, you know, part of the protein is completely unfolded while another part of the protein is completely folded um, according to its uh, fractional context. And, and this uh, different effect on the C terminus of the protein by urea and pressure, I wanna highlight this just to show you, you know, how pressure is different from another kind of denaturant uh, perturbation. So you can see in, in the end terminal part of the protein, so the red, green, and blue, and part of the purple uh, motifs, you know, there's a correlation, linear correlation between the midpoint of urea unfolding and the midpoint of pressure unfolding. But then once you get into this, this, this capping motif and the, and the last uh, repeat and some of the fourth repeat, what you see is that the urea uh, midpoint is the same more or less for all of these um, locally, uh, for all of these residues, uh, but the pressure unfolding uh, midpoint uh, spans almost two kilobar, which is enormous. Um, and so there's, you, you can actually map this, this stability gradient, you know, from the outside into this really central part, the central interaction uh, between the, the capping motif and, and repeat five. Um, and so the, this cluster of residues um, is super pressure stable, but not urea stable. And that's because, of course, it if it unfolds, it, it exposes surface area that the urea will interact with, but uh, there's just very little volume change to be had in there. And so pressure does almost nothing. So um, this is a collaboration with Roland. Um, uh, we wanted to see what shape this, these proteins had. And so um, Roland's group did high pressure sacs on these proteins. Um, and so this is the wild type in urea. This is the C-terminal mutant in a little bit of urea and the end cap with no urea. And what you can see is that um, the P of R plot shows that it's a very elongated structure, the wild type in 1.5 molyurea at high pressure uh, compared to the folded state at low pressure, the Kratky plot 
that also tells the same story. Likewise for the C-terminal capping mutant. Um, but the delta N cap, um, actually it gets a little more elongated, but not that much. Uh, and it retains a fair amount of, of um, uh, globular structure. Um, and you can see here, if you do a urea melt on these proteins uh, under uh, pressure, uh, they all go to a random coil uh, RG value. Uh, N cap's a little lower because it's, it's a smaller protein. Uh, but other than that, um, it's, it's completely unfolded. The wild type and the C-terminal capping mutant uh, in their little urea, a little bit of urea, they also go to completely unfolded states under pressure. But the delta N cap does not. It, it, it stays really compact, um, looking sort of like this, <laughs> if you believe that. Whereas the the wild type and the and the C terminal uh, capping mutant um, are are pretty much unfolded. So um, those are you know chopping off the N terminal uh, capping motif is a pretty drastic thing to do to a protein. Doesn't usually happen. Uh, in evolution, um, but small amino, you know, single amino acid changes do. And so uh, Chewy in, in Doug's lab had um, uh, made a, done what we call five value analysis to understand um, what the transition state looked like. And by the way, she showed that uh, the C-terminal part of the protein was the first to fold, which is what we found also uh, using high pressure. Uh, but so we had these capping, uh, these, um, cavity mutants uh, all across the protein structure. Um, and so uh, we began to look at uh, their pressure unfolding. Um, and um, you can see that if you destabilize the uh, C-terminal part of the protein by uh, a leucine to alanine mutation, then it folds incredibly cooperative, unfolds incre incredibly cooperatively. This is more or less true for these central ones, although I'll show you that the plot thickens there. But again, even a single amino acid mutation in this N-terminal part of the protein leads to, to chaos in protein unfolding um, uh, by pressure. And so um, uh, we wanted to know, okay, that's the, that's the backbone, right? And we've been relying on the backbone as our big NMR observable. Uh, what's happening to the, to the, um, the core, uh, hydrophobic core of the protein. And so instead of um, the NH HSQCs, uh, we did CH HSQCs with N or C13 labeled uh, protein. And we assigned uh, as many of these methyl residues, uh, resonances as we could. Um, and you can see here, the spectrum becomes more unfolded like, although at high pressure, there remains a little bit um, in certain areas uh, at 2,500 bar of, um, of folded state peaks. Um, and indeed, um, the um, backbone and uh, the hydrophobic core of the protein seem to be doing uh, responding in a similar fashion uh, to pressure. Um, of course, these are not necessarily the same residues. Uh, we are uh, dependent on what we can assign, uh, but we assigned a bunch of them, as you can see, and you can tell that, that the N-terminal part of the protein unfolds before the C-terminal part of the protein. Interestingly, <laughs> although we couldn't assign them, we could look at the 1D spectrum of the unfolded proton peaks uh, from the methyl groups. Uh, and what we could see was that we really didn't get much change at all until starting at about 1500 bar. And at 1500 bar over here, you can see that um, the, um, a lot of the intensity has already been lost at many, many residues, both for the amide, but also for, for the methyl peaks. <laughs> and so um, uh, we got uh, you know, uh, similar free energy profiles across the, um, uh, across the structure. And these are, these are the um, uh, histogram of the free energies of unfolding comparing the uh, NH and CH3. And you can see they're, they're reasonably similar. There's some, there's some early loss, uh, low stability um, amides that don't show up, but that may simply be because we couldn't assign uh, the methyl groups in those uh, regions. But in any case, the pattern is the same. And what, it, what this tells us is that we've lost native state peaks. We've gone to some sort of state uh, that um, is not unfolded yet. Um, because the unfolded state peaks are not um, populated. And so there's some sort of, of uh, molten globule-like um, intermediate going on here, at least in some of the parts of the protein. 
Um, and uh, again, um, the high pressure sacks um, that now we can do in um, in the United States, still in collaboration with Roland, but I wanna give a shout out to, to Chess uh, at uh, Cornell. Um, it's the only place in the United States right now you can do high pressure bio sacks. Um, and uh, with all the things that Roland has told you about LLPS and amyloids and all that, uh, the uh, applications are just enormous. And I encourage you to, um, to contact Richard, who's the Beamline scientist, Richard Gilliland, um, and uh, talk to him about the possibility of, of doing high pressure sacks there. So again, you know, we still have a fairly uh, folded or globular structure uh, for the I7A, just like we saw for the Delta N cap. What about if we, um, so, so if, we, if we get rid of, you know, an L uh, to A here uh, on the C terminus makes it super cooperative, an L to A here on the N terminus makes it super uncooperative and molten globule intermediates and, and, and all that. Um, what happens if we hit it in the middle and in, in the middle here, oops, in the middle here, um, if you do an L to A mutation, what you do is like really, really add to this cavernous cavity in the middle of the protein. Um, and so um, uh, this protein is a special case. It looked, as I showed you, pretty cooperative uh, according to the amide uh, resonances uh, as we unfolded it. Um, but if you look more carefully, uh, next to those amide resonance we were losing, uh, we were picking up these intermediate peaks uh, that were in slow exchange on the NMR time scale. Um, and uh, if we plotted the decrease in intensity of the folded state peak, we could pick up an increase in intensity of the intermediate peak that uh, didn't really go away with pressure. And all the residues that showed this behavior were in the C-terminal part of the protein. So these differences in PPM are quite small. These are not unfolded states. They're native-like states, um, probably shifted in, uh, in resonance frequency because the, re the protein around them is uh, disrupted. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this part of the protein remains uh, pretty folded, I think, uh, while this part of the protein is um, populating uh, some sort of intermediate. Um, and so, um, uh, we again wanted to look at the um, the uh, core, the hydrophobic core of the protein with C13 um, uh, proton uh, HSQC in the in the methyl bearing side chain regions, and um, you can see that it, it, it there's still some some folded state stuff going on here, um, and but um, actually except for this one residue that that uh, seems to form an intermediate. Uh, that's that's very close. Um, you know the unfolding profiles uh, by uh, the amides and the methyls seem to agree. Um, and when we look at the unfolded state methyl peaks at these two frequencies in the one D spectrum, what we can see is we start to lose right away. Unlike the the L um, the I seven A mutant in the N terminus, we start to gain uh, unfolded state methyl peaks, but uh, by a kilobar here, you know, we're pretty much done with uh, the amides and uh, folded state methyl peaks, but we're only about halfway through the transition uh, for, um, uh, for the unfolded state methyl peaks. And so um, again, um, we're forming some sort of uh, molten globule intermediate uh, uh, in uh, L7A. Um, and I, I should say that we're, we're doing um, uh, high pressure CPMG and CEST measurements right now to try and figure out um, uh, where these peaks are going, <laughs> especially the amide peaks, you know, what, what sort of intermediate they're populating. So that'll be coming soon. Um, and uh, so it, it, this L60A mutant, we also uh, subjected it to high pressure sacs again with uh, Richard um, at uh, CHESS. And uh, what you can see is that it does become more elongated. Uh, the, the radius of gyration goes up, but, um, but much less than, you know, the radius of gyration of the unfolded protein completely is 45 uh, angstrom. So we're well, well below um, what the uh, random um, coil would, would look like uh, in SACS. Um, and and the, the R max, the largest distance between scattering centers, it increases from 
about you know, 75 to about 105 or 110, but, um, but it's not uh, 150 like it is uh, for the wild type protein uh, in urea. Uh, and again, uh, the cracky plots show that, that this protein retains a lot. So this is atmospheric one and two kilobar. It retains a lot of um, folded state characteristics, uh, globular characteristics. Uh, and so this is what... <laughs> Damn, it tells us it looks like uh, you can take that with a grain of salt. Uh, it's, the protein is elongated to begin with, but it doesn't get that much more elongated uh, under pressure. Um, so the C, the the we know that the L139 AD stabilizes the C terminus. So when we compare the um, the HSQC uh, in the methyl region, the C13 proton HSQC, we can see that it, we get a very clean unfolded state spectrum for this guy and um, everything unfolds super cooperatively and the um, unfolded state methyls also come up at exactly the, the same pressure uh, kilobar as the midpoint you know, in both, both of these cases. Um, and so uh, the energies, the unfolding free energies um, locally along the chain are all the same. And uh, even though this is positive and this is negative because my students are different, um, the, uh, you know, the free energy of unfolding uh, is, is histogram is, is almost exactly the same. And so, um, and again, it's a, it's a, a, a very elongated, unfolded protein. The cracky plot looks completely unfolded compared to the, the folded state. Um, and, um, and so, you know, cavities in context, they all, all of these globally speaking destabilized, Doug and, and Tui showed this uh, years ago that, all of these cavity mutations destabilize the protein by about a kilocal, which is what Brian Matthews said they should do. And, and, and that's, that holds true in this case as well. Uh, but they have massively different uh, implications for the landscape, for the, the conformational landscapes uh, of the protein, depending on where you put them. And so, you know, you start out with a protein, a wild type protein that has a stability gradient. Uh, and if you if you put a cavity in the end terminus, then you you amplify you exacerbate the stability gradient um, across the protein. If you put a cavity in the C terminus, then uh, you destabilize the C terminus and, and you you get rid of the stability gradient. It's a completely cooperative unfolding transition. Um, but if you put it in the middle, which is kind of like a Goldilocks situation here, uh, what you do is you cut the protein in half. Uh, so this part of the protein gets totally messed up, but this guy is still super stable. Um, and so you get these, these, this intermediate where, um, uh, you know, there's some multiglobule characteristics maybe out here. Um, you know, this part of the protein is, is, is uh, really disrupted because that's where the cavity is. Uh, but this part of the protein is solid as a rock. Um, and so really um, cavity position uh, modifies the stability gradient. And you can imagine that in the wild type protein, the sequence has been, uh, has evolved um, uh, to tune for function. Um, it may be that this fly catching and terminal instability has something to do with the fact that this protein is a, uh, plays a role in protein protein interactions and transcriptional regulation. Um, and that uh, its sequence is probably tuned for that function. More generally, um, it's interesting to look at sequences and, and see if we can think, find uh, molecular signatures for uh, adaptation to particular environments um, in which the sequence has to be tuned to maintain, for example, uh, this stability gradient, even if, um, you know, the organism uh, lives hypothetically at high temperature, high pressure, low pH, or whatever uh, uh, the, uh, the situation may be. And so um, I think that it, if we're to understand how, how life evolved on Earth, to understand how um, disease occurs because of um, very you know, single site mutations uh, in, in folded proteins, uh, then it's really important to be able to um, investigate these um, these um, landscapes, both energetically and, and structurally in as great a detail as possible. And I hope I've convinced you that pressure allows us to do that. 
So I just want to thank the people who've um, worked. All these people have worked uh, with me on high pressure. It's been a, a lot of really good years. Um, but the, what I showed you today was a collaboration with, with Doug Barrick and Hopkins um, um, people. In, and, and also, of course, Roland, who's we've been collaborating since the mid 90s. Uh, and Angel Garcia, who, who actually taught me anything I know about computation. Um, and um, and then uh, the students in my group, uh, uh, Martin, who's now in, in St. Louis, um, uh, with Rohit Papu and, and and Kelly Jenkins, and now the current student, Siwen, who did all the assignments and uh, and the methyl uh, proton um, high pressure NMR. Uh, and I want to thank the NSF for funding all this and uh, you for your attention. Thank you, Kathy, very much for this lovely talk. Uh to questions and uh, since we're to end this then, I'm going to promote uh, anyone who wants to talk directly to Kathy uh, to the panel. But Kathy, we have one anonymous question first, and it's in the Q&A. And the question is, the HSQC at high pressure doesn't look like a disordered protein, too few peaks. What's going on? So, um, so we think those uh, peaks are um, exchange broadened um, below the limits of detection. So we don't have the unfolded peaks. We, it's a case of missing intensity, right? So we lose the folded state peak intensity. We don't have the unfolded state peak intensity. And this has been observed for molten globules. Uh, apomyoglobin comes to mind uh, um, uh, by Peter Wright's group, I think a long time ago. Um, but um, I think that's what's happening under pressure for this particular uh, protein, the I7A. Um, because the the um, the uh, the other proteins, the L139A, for example, and the wild type in urea, you know, we get we get the very high intensity peaks in the center of the spectrum, right? Um, but um, but for some of them, we don't we don't see those unfolded state peaks coming up enough, and uh, and so that's why we're doing uh, CPMG uh, at uh, intermediate pressures and also CEST experiments uh, in order to try and figure out where that intensity went um, and what the, what the resonance are. Are they native like? Are they unfolded like? Um, we're trying to figure that out. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. So uh, I just put a little note in the chat if you would like to use the raise hand um, icon, I can promote you to the panel. Actually, if maybe nobody has any questions, but I can go back um, to... Oh, no, no, we have lots of questions. Which <laughs> I'm gonna um. promote, well, uh, promote um, Bina. And Bina, Hi. you now have the ability to talk. Yes. Uh... Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, is a general question. So when, when you think of organisms living in deep ocean at high pressure, the outer atmospheric pressure is very high. But uh, do we know that the inside of the cell also experiences the same kind of pressure or are there mechanisms, you know? Yeah, pressure is not like protons. You can't you can't pump it out. Uh, so it's the same pressure inside as outside. Um, it's hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and so, so yes, all of those molecules and all of those organisms uh, in the deep biosphere are really at high pressure. And so they must have somehow evolved their sequences, or their sequences must have somehow evolved uh, to um, to resist that and to be functional under those conditions. And so I'm really interested in trying to figure out. What so, those but then there's also this concept of osmotic pressure, right? From the inside, if the if the pressure is somehow, you know, uh, no, you're right. There, that so, concept come into play. The turgor pressure kind of system that exists in plant cells. Would you would you have something like that? So, so deep sea and and uh, at least deep sea organisms. I'm not so sure about uh, elsewhere in the deep biosphere, but um, because we don't know that much about those uh, organisms. But in the deep sea, it's been shown that um, osmolites are upregulated. The production of osmolites, like TMAO, that that Roland spoke about earlier, are upregulated um, in some deep sea organisms, um, and um, 
And so osmotic pressure counteracts hydrostatic pressure effects um, for the reasons that, that Roland showed you, because um, it, it, it favors, you know, high uh, osmolite concentration favors association, it favors folding, you know, it favors native states of, of protein. So one, you're right, one of the, the ways that organisms have adapted to deal with these pressures, but I don't think it's the only way, um, is to produce osmolites to counteract the, the destabilizing effects of pressure on their biomolecules. Um, and, and, you know, that's for certain. And, and, you know, the enzymes that produce these things get upregulated. There's a whole transcriptional program that occurs. And there are, there are organisms, um, our friend Doug Bartlett studies this photobacterium profundum, which is a misnomer because it doesn't see any photons where it lives, um, but because uh, it's in the deep sea, but it moves up and down the water column. And when it does that, um, its transcriptional program changes and the, the, um, you know, one of the things it does when it goes down uh, is produce osmolites, just like sharks. Sharks produce osmolites when they dive deep. Um, so, okay. Could I ask one question or should I wait? Sure, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. So how about the sequence uh, compositions? So if you were to really look at the same enzyme from a deep sea organism uh, versus, would we see, you know, apart from the catalytic side probably need to be maintained, but do, would we see a difference in the composition itself to take care of the pressure effect? So, so global composition changes a little bit, but there's no real distinct pattern. Obviously, sequences change, but sequences change. <laughs> you know, if you look at a multiple sequence alignment of some protein family and you try and decipher what what is it that's different in these high pressure, these enzymes from high pressure organisms compared to a mesophile is really hard to, to pull that information out. And I think, you know, that's one of our challenges that we don't understand. Uh, we can't read the sequences in terms of molecular adaptation to the various uh, complicated environments on the planet. And I think it, there's a, a wealth of information to be gained if we could, if we knew how to read those sequences. Uh, but for the moment, we don't. And one of the reasons is that there are not enough people working in, in you know, extreme biophysics. And so we haven't got enough data uh, yet to, to be, even begin to see any patterns. Um, but that's what we'd like to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Kathy. So we have a question in the Q&A uh, by Luigi. And it says, very interesting presentation. Have you tried multiple mutants combining the mutations that increase cooperativity with those that decrease it? And Luigi, I'm gonna promote you to um, the chat, um, the live talk feature, in case you wanna follow up and have additional questions. So, so Luigi, we haven't done that. Um, but I would predict if, for example, we made a double I7A L139A mutation, that, um, yeah, that we would still, we'd have a, um, we'd have a, a, a an attenuated yes. gradient in this protein because we would still destabilize the um, the N terminus, right? And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be flat. The N terminus would unfold at lower pressures than the C terminus, but the C terminus would fold at lower pressures than it did in the wild type. So I think that we would get uh, a decreased gradient in, in the... Um, so, so something intermediate between the effects of the two individual mutants. Yeah, yeah. Um, and depending okay. on where you put them, you might like get some sort of uh, bifurcated, <laughs> you know, like, okay. like the L60A mutant did. Of course, this, like I said, this is a repeat protein. It's a model system that we, because our brains can't think around a, a, a globular protein, but, um, you know, it's, it's easy to, to play around with cooperativity in, in, in a system like this. In a globular protein, you know, it gets much more complicated. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. So, um, I don't see any more questions uh, specifically for Kathy, so I'm going to turn it over to Rams, and he's going to open the session to a general discussion. Anyone wants to join the panel, please raise your hand. We can enable you to participate in the discussion directly. 
Kathy, a lovely talk. I wanted to ask you this question that your N terminus, central region and C terminus, they behave differently. And uh, you look at only the chemical shift dispersion. How about T1 and T2 parameters? Do they, they must be different, right? Because the correlation time should be changing. Um, how do they vary? So we, we looked at those really just for practical, practical reasons, because we wanted to make sure that um, our D1 value was long enough to uh, allow for relaxation between <laughs> experiments. It doesn't change that much. You know, the shape of the protein changes, but, it, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, T2 changes, of course, but, um, you know, um, the, the relaxation parameters um, will be pressure dependent, but it, they're small, right? Uh, but but we, we're really interested in looking at the dynamics that say the CPMG kind of, you know, microsecond, uh, hundreds of microseconds to millisecond time scale uh, for these, um, to, 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 to try and understand what the intermediates are doing. Um, so in, interesting, the T1 is not changing, but T2 are different. Um, would that mean that you are picking up solid state like behavior where you see residual proton proton dipolar couplings appearing to broaden the line? Maybe? Yeah, we get, I mean, we don't see super evidence for line broadening, you know, but we always are very careful to take the integrals of the peak and not just the peak height, just to avoid any artifacts that might come from a subtle changes in T2, right? Um, and, and, and so, so we, you know, um, I, I don't think. I think that the dynamics, the time scale of the dynamic changes, the strong ones are at longer time scales, right? Um, than, um, than fast dynamics. Um, that's not to say there's nothing going on, but um, it's, you know, and we've done even high pressure ZZ exchange on another protein with Dan Raleigh. Um, and so if you're lucky and your time scales are what they are, you even get the kinetics of the, and, and as an added benefit, you get to assign the unfolded state peaks, right? Sure. Because, uh, and, and so, you know, there, there are a lot of games you can play with, with NMR and every protein is a different story, right? It's going to allow you to do certain things and not others. Certain things will change and not others. It's, it's uh, like I say, it's the devils and the details and, and in biology and NMR really lets you uh, delve into those details. Absolutely. By the way, Dan Raleigh tried to join the Zoom link. He couldn't uh, get into the Zoom links for some difficult time. Oh, so he apologizes yeah. for not joining the seminar. No, that's uh, that sounds too bad. Nina, you raise your hand. Go ahead, ask the question. Yes, um, I have a question for Dr. Roland. So in one of your, uh, you know, a couple of your slides, you showed that the, in the catalytic efficiency of the enzyme is increasing with the pressure. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So isn't that a little counterintuitive? Because with the pressure, you are unfolding the protein, but then your um, activity is also increasing? Um, yeah, actually, that's a, a good point. Of course, the pressure has not been so high so that the protein unfolds, right? So the protein, uh, the pressure has always been much lower than the unfolding pressure, yeah? Okay. And, 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 and so, so in principle, then you observe, can observe both, yeah? A retardation and acceleration of the reaction. And you see an acceleration only, for example, in the example I have shown you here, when the volume of the transition state of your enzyme substrate complex is smaller than that of your enzyme substrate uh, ground state complex, right? So this right. is the this is a essential reason uh, for an acceleration. But quite often you also observe the opposite, right? So if the, for example, if the uh, activated complex would have a larger volume to due to an increase of hydration or something like that. Yeah, that, then you would uh, see just the opposite. Yeah, so the so the pressure has been uh, always much lower than the unfolding pressure. Okay. Yeah, just uh, just to pipe in here, the activation volume for protein folding is almost always large and positive. So folding slows down a whole lot uh, as a function of pressure. That's why yeah. pressure unfolds proteins because it slows the folding rate. So what's nice about pressure generally is that um, volume changes are not only different in magnitude, but they're different in sign, uh, as, as Roland pointed out. And so you can get really different um, effects uh, depending on, on which protein you're looking at. So, so. 
fun. Okay. How much does the water structure change because of pressure contribute to the changes that we are observing? Yes, absolutely. Really at very high pressure. I mean, yes. the actual water structure. So, so that's actually a very good point. Uh, we, we, we didn't mention that one because the effect is rather low, right? So for example, yeah, I mean, around the protein, you have a hydration volume, right? And this yeah. has very little differences regarding density compared to bulk water, right? So it's typically three to 8% a bit uh, higher density, but the structure is still very similar. And the water structure changes above about five, six kilobars significantly only. Then your second hydration shell is coming to the first one, right? And the number of, uh, of uh, nearest neighbors increases. But below five, six kilobars, the water structure is hardly affected at all. Yeah, so it, 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 it doesn't have a significant effect on the properties we are observing in this lower pressure range. Yeah? And of course, at much, at much higher uh, pressures, 10, 12 kilobar, then you get into different water structures and finally freezing different ice structures and so on. Yeah. I would point out one, one interesting thing about the pressure temperature phase diagram of water is that if you go to two kilobar, you can actually go down to t minus 20 Celsius and still be liquid. Um, and so, you know, there are some changes and you can take advantage of those if you want to do like cold denaturation studies and things like that. You can just go up to two kilobar and then cool it down. Um, and so. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I, have I want question. to ask a Go ahead, Bikash. Yeah, yes. I have a question for both like Professor Roland and Catherine. So I was wondering, like looking at your HSQC data, it gave me some impression like from the first slide that Professor Ronald was showing like how the aquatic animals can go deep into the sea where your pressure is like in terms of like like several uh, hundreds of kilobars. I was wondering like uh, if you look at like Professor Lucy Avancy who is doing kind of like insel NMR. So I was imagining like kind of getting an impression like if you do the insel NMR with a similar kind of pressure, do you think like the crowding environment and other particles would protect the proteins to like unfold in those kind of places? Like, how do you think about that? Roland? <laughs> uh, so if I understand you co correct, um, so this is a really open question. What really stabilizes the protein molecules, right? And uh, under high pressure conditions. So in fact, uh, in cell NMR under high pressure conditions might be interesting. And of course, in cells from deep sea, right? Because what we have learned in recent years, I mean, Kathy mentioned that before. I mean, the question is, does the protein structure change a lot? And, and as far as I know, for the very few examples known, there is very little effect. People have been very disappointed that the protein structure doesn't change much. Of course, the sequence changes a bit, but obviously maybe a few salt bridges, maybe the cavity size changes a bit, um, but this is a rather minor effect, but it's not much known about that as Kathy pointed out. But what stabilizes proteins and other biomolecules, for example, non-canonical DNA structures is crowding. Yeah? Significant increase of crowding and compatible osmolites could dramatically stable proteins and other biomolecules and, 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 and uh, guarantee their function even under these high uh, stress conditions. And of course that, I mean, the ultimate experiment would be in cell NMR under such kind of conditions in such kind of cells, right? But hasn't been done. Yeah. So this is case. Yeah, like, like what, next, next project, like, yeah. Like what I was wondering is like, like for the human being, like even though we go to some higher temperature, our body, like the cell actually control the temperature at 37 degrees centigrade. It never yeah. goes up, right? So that is what actually I was wondering, like in vitro it is understandable, but when we are going to in like kind of in cell, so I would assume like the things will be a little different than what Kathleen uh, showed us today in the in vitro NMR, especially looking at the HSQC spectrum. 
I, I mean, oh. what's, quite, what's quite interesting, if I just may add that, I mean, there are a few papers showing that even self, at, at least uh, for a bit of time, can survive even 10, 20 kilobars, much, much higher, right, than the deep sea conditions, right? Yeah, so, so pressure has a less severe effect than, than temperature, I think. But yeah, totally we, we, unknown, totally unknown blah, 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 how, how, how they can survive, right? I mean, this is... And we don't know what the pressure limits of life are. So at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, we go to a kilobar. In the, in the deep biosphere, in the, in the crusts, you can go higher than that in pressure because of the rock. <laughs> it's heavier, it's more dense than water, right? And so the pressures are somewhat higher. But um, on some of the exoplanets, one of them, I can't remember, Encephalus or Encephalus or whatever it's called, it, yeah. you know, the ocean is 100 kilometers deep, right? And so could there be life at 100 kilometers deep, right? So that would be 100, um, uh, let's see, 1,000 megapascals or 10 kilobar, right, at the bottom. Um, we don't know. We don't know what the pressure limits of life are. Um, the temperature limits of life seem to be at about 120 degrees. Um, uh, that's been measured, but we have no idea what the pressure limits of life are. Um, we just um, put together a high pressure temperature controlled microscope using that same capillary that, that Roland uh, talked about. And we started to do high pressure effects using fluorescence, not NMR, but in live cells under pressure. And I, you know, it's, there's not, not much going on <laughs> out there <laughs> like that uh, yet, but we need a lot more data. And so anybody who might be interested in coming into the pressure field, you know, we're still very welcoming because it's kind of a lonely spot to be. <laughs> The next question is from uh, David Eisenberg. David, go ahead, ask a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I really appreciated uh, both talks from Professor Winter and Professor uh, Royer uh, because they interpreted the results uh, in terms of fundamentals. And in that spirit, I'd like to ask Professor Winter about folding funnels. He showed us several images of folding funnels. For aggregating systems, which is the interest of many of us, there the free energy, which is represented in folding funnels, depends on concentration very strongly. So as the concentration changes, it seems to me you need a completely different set of a different folding funnels. It's like you need a whole series of those, one for each concentration. I, I haven't seen uh, images like that, and I'm wondering about your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, um, this is actually a very good point. Yeah? So that's also the reason showing such kind of things here yeah, always uh, um, makes me feel um, a bit uh, unhappy because the concentration dependence has never been looked at. Yeah, and, and this is this is actually a, a very good point, right? So in principle, one has to measure the concentration dependence and then uh, look for the chemical potential and things like that, but it has never been done, right? Mm. So, so this is very artificial, this kind of combined monomeric unfolding aggregation funnel, this combination is very artificial. Yeah, you are completely right. But we, at the moment, we have no, uh, no data uh, to, 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 to plot that uh, more satisfactory. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like um, there are no, no other questions. Let me check Q&A box. Yeah, we answered all the questions. Thank you both well, very sorry, much I... for the great talks. I'm sorry, you have another question? Go ahead. Yeah, I have one more question. I think uh, Joanne is also here. So I have one question from the kind of like computational field to understand this one because uh, Professor Winter was actually showing one slide where he is comparing the pressure and the temperature uh, on the unfolding, right? I was wondering, like, like, is there any report? Like, I'm not well uh, aware about the literature on the pressure, like, based on unfolding. From the computational point of view, I was wondering, like, like when you do the same experiment uh, for the temperature and pressure, do you know, like, uh, how much effect they have on the intramolecular hydrogen bonding versus hydrophobic packing? Like, do pressure break the hydrophobic interaction much faster than like the temperature and vice versa for the intra and intermolecular hydrogen bonding? 
He can. So, <laughs> there, I can. <laughs> yeah. So pressure, uh, Roland said, yeah, it's, pressure stabilizes hydrogen bonds. And that's why double-stranded DNA doesn't do anything under pressure. It compresses a little bit, you know, but, but nothing more than that. Um, the pressure effects on hydrophobic interactions are sort of complicated because uh, you know, if you think of them in the in the context of lipids, like Roland showed, lipids are highly compressible, and so those interactions are strongly favored by pressure, right? Um, and and you know, pressure doesn't blow up liposomes, right? It it <laughs> it, it, it stabilizes uh, bilayers and and whatnot. So, uh, but in the context of a protein we can tell that the hydrophobic core often gets exploded uh, by pressure. It falls, you know, unfolds. And, and the reason isn't so much direct pressure effects on hydrophobic interactions, but the fact that there are, are uh, solvent excluded void volumes in the structure of the folded protein that are not present in the unfolded protein. Uh, and so eventually Le Chatelier's principle says, you know, because the volume is, is, is lower, when you get rid of those voids, you're going to populate the unfolded state. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not compressing, you know, the protein. You compress the hydrophobic interactions uh, to the extent possible, uh, given the backbone interactions, right, and, and structure in, in a protein. Uh, you compress all states of every molecule as you apply pressure, right? But... Um, but there's this big volume difference between molar volume difference between the folded state and unfolded state that doesn't have to do with the compressibility of hydrophobics, but the fact uh, the, the specific structural characteristics of the folded state. And also if there are electrostriction, um, you know, ionizable residues uh, inside. Um, and so, you know, they kind of go against each other if, if you wish, right? Um, you compress both the folded state and the unfolded state with pressure. The difference in the compressibility is, is pretty small, which is why we get linear plots of delta G versus pressure. Well, and David Eisenberg, well, go ahead. Uh, just adding a historical note to what you said, uh, Bridgman showed that he could cook an egg at very high pressures, uh, completely denaturing the proteins. And uh, Kautzman's work on high pressure on, on, uh, on um, the hydrophobic interaction showed that at moderate pressures, uh, there's uh, stability, increased stability, but at much higher pressures than the effect that you've described takes over. I just wanna show you, uh, I don't know if you can see this, the physics of high pressure by Percy Bridgman. <laughs> it's right here at my desk. <laughs> A but, wonderful um, classic. Yes, it is. But the reason he cooked the egg is because it, it was an irreversible unfolding of the, of the albumin, I suppose, suppose in yeah. the, in the yeah. egg. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he published a paper in, when was it? It was uh, 1912, uh, I think, 19, or 1914, 19, 19, right? It's one half page or one page in the JBC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it says uh, that he discovered, um, incidentally, by the way, that pressure can cook an egg. <laughs> It's a great paper to read. <laughs> thanks, David. Uh, thanks, uh, both the speakers, for the lovely talk and nice Q&A session. Let's formally close the session for today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks. I would like to remind all the participants to join us on June 23rd uh, for presentations from early career researchers. Uh, Zoom link will be sent to you later. Sorry about the mess with the Zoom link today we had. Um, hope we can fix the problem. Uh, we will not hear any more problems with that. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, John. Thanks for inviting us. Take care. Yes. Have a good summer. Thanks, Thank Roland. Thanks.